We have, it is spring, by the way. I know there's supposed to be like a, a light mix of ice and snow tonight, but hey, it's spring. Just keep telling yourself that, okay? We've been studying the life of Jesus, and it's really an amazing story, a compelling story, the story of Jesus, whether it was the 40 days of fasting and temptation in the desert. Some of you do intermittent fasting, and you think you're doing great to make it till noon, right? 40 days of fasting. Or perhaps it's the miracles he performed or the people that he knew in personal relationship or the lessons that he taught. Without a doubt, this is the greatest story ever told. And we would love for you to have a copy of it today. This morning, we're going to talk about the triumph of the great servant king. Now, that's the title of our message, The Triumph of of the great servant king. Now let's break that down a little bit. Triumph is not an esoteric brand of motorcycle that you might be thinking of. That's not what I'm talking about. Triumph means a great victory or an achievement that you celebrate with joy or jubilation. That's a triumph. And and it's the triumph of the servant king. Jesus Christ is the servant king. Now, servant king sounds a little odd to our ears. We don't think of a king who is a servant, or kings don't normally serve, and certainly they they rule and they reign. And kings certainly don't suffer. They're victorious. They're winners. They're uh, the ones who are king, right? They don't normally suffer, and they don't normally serve. So the great servant king is like an oxymoron. Pastor Phil, did you just call me a bad name when you said that? I wonder how many of you ever got in trouble for saying that word around your house when you were a kid. I'm sure I did on maybe, maybe more than one occasion. No, uh, an oxymoron is simply uh, two terms that don't seem to go together, but they actually do. Servant king. So the message today is about, is about the great servant king, It's about suffering, and it's about winning, Uh, about Christ's suffering and Christ's winning, but also about your suffering and your winning. And truly, suffering is a part of the world in which we live. And we're, we're often confronted with that in very stark and painful ways. Uh, Right now, my family and I, we're praying for a very dear friend of ours who, um, who is in the process of dying of cancer. And uh, his, he was a pastor, and we, called, we always called him Brother Jimmy. Brother Jimmy lives in Pikeville, Tennessee, but he grew up in rural Kentucky, the son of a sharecropper. I mean, yes, there still exists in areas, right, at least when he was growing up. Very poor. He was the only person in his family to ever go to college, and he went to Bible college. Because as a young man of 17 years old, uh, he felt the Lord calling him to preach. He got married when he was 19. His wife, Joan, was 17 when they got married. They went off to Bible college. And for the past 52 years, they've been pastoring rural churches in the South. In December of this past year, he retired from 52 years of ministry. And they thought, and they told me, well, we're going to travel. We're going to visit our grandchildren. We're going to, you know, visit you guys up in Chicago. They've never been up here. We're going to do all of these things that we've never been able to do because we've been faithfully serving God for 52 years. That was in December, a month ago, perhaps less than a month ago. He went to the doctor with symptoms. They said, you have stage 4 colon cancer, you have just a few weeks to live. And this morning, while we're all here celebrating Easter, he's in a hospital bed sedated because of the severe pain with just a few days to live. And his wife, we've been texting her, encouraging her, and, and she just is repeating the same things. We were, this was going to be our time. We were going to travel. We were going to do all of these things. My friend, life is full of 
unfair things. Life is full of suffering. We're all confronted by it. But the question is, is how do we overcome it? My message today is about suffering and about winning. And to look at this, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a Bible there in the book rack in front of you. And, and you, you're welcome to look in that Bible. If it's easier for you, all you have to do is turn to page 1,252. Page 1252 is going to bring you to our text in Acts chapter 1. You say, Pastor Phil, do you have an outline for your message today, for notes for our message? Uh, yes, I do. It's on page 1,252. <laughs> And um, I'm going to do something that you probably will, you know, you don't hear a pastor say very often. I'm going to invite you, if you would like to, to write in your Bible. Okay, we're going to, we're going to look at the outline together because it's right here. And even if you're, I'm going to do this, and I may get in trouble for this, but that's okay. I stay in trouble about half the time. If you have the church pew Bible in your lap, I'm going to allow you to mark three marks in the black pew Bible so that you can see the outline with me. And we're going to read through this together as we make our way down through here. And, um, and you won't get lost, and you're going to learn something very helpful from, from, from the Bible for your life today. Let's begin in verse 1 of Acts chapter 1. And it says here, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now he says, uh, the writer says here, The former account I made. What is he referring to? Well, the book of Acts is part two of a two volume set. Uh, volume one is the gospel according to Luke. It was written by Dr. Luke, who was a medical doctor and an historian. And he, in his writings, if you read the Gospel of Luke, you'll see medical details and historical details that the other Gospel writers did not include in their accounts. And that's because he was a medical doctor, and he was very detailed, focused on the history of these events. And so he wrote two volumes, and, and he wrote the first volume about everything that Jesus taught and did. That's the gospel according to Luke. And now we're seeing kind of a transition in chapter 1. He's transitioning to Acts, and which is what, you know, the rest of what the apostles went on to do. And it says here in verse 1 that he wrote to Theophilus. Now moms, please do me a big favor. Do not name any of your newborn little babies Theophilus. You know, it sounds an awful lot like the awfulest right? You don't want your child going to school with a name that Theophilus that rhymes with Theophilus, right? It's kind of like, you know, naming your boy Sue. You're setting him up for all kinds of troubles, right? There aren't any Johnny Cash fans in the room today? I, I, <laughs> I'm out here on a limb, guys. Help me out. Theophilus, Theo means God. Phileo means love. So the name Theophilus means lover of God. Now, some scholars say that this was a real person that Luke was writing to and sharing with him the story of Jesus. You know, he was giving him a book, like we're going to give you a book today, right? Other scholars say, well, it may or may not have been a real person, but truly this book is written to every lover of God out there. So if you love God and you want to know God better, then I would say read the Gospel of Luke and read the book of Acts. And as you do, I mean, they were written for the very specific purpose of helping you to love God more and know God better. So I encourage you to do that. Now, notice uh, verse 3 with me, if you would. We're going to move on here. It says, he wrote, and he, he talks about to whom, and he's referring to the apostles there, Jesus presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, 
being seen by them during 40 days. So we're at the resurrection, which is kind of what we're at today, right? So this is a, a key verse that shows what we're talking about today, that Jesus Christ presented himself alive from the dead to his apostles after he had suffered all of those horrible things on the cross, and there were many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days. Now, if a scientist were to come into the room today and say, what is proof of the resurrection? And, you know, we, in our Western mind, in our, we automatically think of science, and there has to be scientific proof. But uh, there's some lawyers in the room today, and they would tell you that there's another kind of evidence and proof that would be like historical evidence. There's no scientific proof that George Washington was the first president of the United States, but you believe that he was. There's no scientific proof, but there's a, there's a, there's a mountain of historical proof or evidence, right? Uh, documents that he left, things that he said that are attributed to him, or people that s- saw him and they wrote their accounts. And that, my friend, that's exactly what you have, these infallible proofs that Jesus rose from the dead. He, he stayed on the earth for 40 days. He was seen by the apostles on multiple occasions. He was seen at one time by over 500 people at once. So these are some of the proofs. But what I want you to notice here is that He presented himself alive after his suffering. Now, I said you can mark in your Bible. If you have your pen, this is your first mark. You're only going to get three. Okay, this is the first one, okay? Underline the words, his suffering. And, And you can put a little one beside it, his suffering. He is the suffering servant. He suffered. That's part of our topic. He suffered. When it says that he, when I say that he is the servant king, what kind of servant was he? He was a suffering servant. He was a suffering servant. And these aren't really my words. This is taken, this idea that he suffered and that he was a suffering servant. This whole point number one is taken from Isaiah. Isaiah, the the prophet Isaiah, you'll remember him. He wrote a poem about how the Messiah would be a suffering servant. And, And he wrote in the book of Isaiah, which is way back in the Old Testament. Now listen to this. It was written 700 years before Jesus Christ was even born. 700 years. It was written, my friends, Hundreds of years before death by crucifixion was even a thing. And yet he describes it in great detail. Why? How? Because it was a prophetic word. He was pre, uh, pre-telling the future, what would happen to the Messiah when he came. And he said that he would suffer. Now Isaiah is an amazing book. And it's a very poetic book. It can be a little bit harder to understand because of that. Uh, We have a a Bible class each Sunday morning from 9.45 to 10.45. Now, today we're going to be out in the Family Center at our Easter celebration reception. But on a normal Sunday, here in this building, we have a Bible class from 9.45 to 10.45. And they are about to begin a new study on the book of Isaiah itself. And so you're invited to be a part of that Bible class. They meet downstairs each Sunday. They have a great thing going on down there, and you would be a part of that, and you would learn more about Isaiah. Did you know that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, this Old Testament book that was written 700 years before Christ was even born, did you know that it is the most quoted book in the New Testament? Because it has so much, some people call it the fifth gospel. Right? There are four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They each wrote their story of Jesus from their perspective. And, um, but Isaiah, 700 years before, wrote so many details about Christ and the Messiah that many scholars call it the fifth gospel. But it was written 700 years before. So finally, this poem that Isaiah wrote, it's in Isaiah 53, we're not going to turn there, but it describes for us how the Messiah would die. 
It says, first of all, that he would be rejected and that he would suffer. It says that he would be pierced for our transgressions and that he would be crushed for our sins. And the New Testament tells us that they pierced his hands and his feet in crucifixion. They said, uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah said that the Messiah would not speak in his defense, but that he would be slaughtered like a lamb. And what did John call him? Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So this was all fulfilled. 700 years later, in Christ, it, it said, the prophet Isaiah said that in his poem that he would be so tortured that his face would be so marred that it would not even look human. And we know that to be the case. And then he said that the Messiah would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And that's exactly what happened. So finally, the Messiah, Isaiah states that the Messiah would die for the sins of others. In Isaiah 53, it said he was bruised for our transgressions, and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is perhaps the most important part of the crucifixion. It's what we call, theologians call, substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. That's a big word. If, you wanna, if you're talking to your Christian friends, you just throw out the term substitutionary atonement and, and you'll, get, you'll get a lot of street cred with that one, okay? Simply means that Jesus became our substitute in receiving our punishment for our sins, it was all laid on him. And so he paid for your sins for you so that you could be forgiven and have eternal life. And that's really what the cross represents. The price that Jesus paid for your salvation. You know, sometimes we have the idea, the, the mistaken idea, that uh, if we're good enough... God will accept us into his heaven. If we try really hard and we do our best effort and we try to keep the Ten Commandments and we try to be nice to our neighbor and we try to go to church sometimes and we try to do all of these good things that we somehow we are gaining points with God and so when our final day comes that we will have done enough good that he would accept us as his children. My friends, that is not the way the gospel works. That will, that will not work for you for one very simple reason. You are a sinner. And the Bible says that the best that we can do, because we're fallen, because we're full of pride, because we have these not-so-good tendencies, even the best that we do is, is in God's eyes, holy and righteous and perfect God. In His eyes, our best is as filthy rags compared to His holiness. It's not acceptable So he's not going to accept us based upon how good of a person that we have been, simply because we haven't been good enough. We fall, he says that we fall short of his glory. You say, well, I'm not that bad of a person. You know, I'm not like out there, you know, committing crimes and stuff. Okay, let's put it this way. Let's say, let's say that from this banister to that banister, is the glory of God, the perfection of God. From there to there, that's the perfection of God. And and I'm going to jump from here to there. Are you ready for this? This is like an Olympic sport. Not that I've been in it. I'm going to jump. I'm going to really try, okay? Now, you haven't seen Pastor Phil do this in church in quite a while, probably never. I'm going to see. Now, when I was in the sixth grade, I was in the running long jump. But that was a long time. I'm going to see how far I can jump, okay? How many of you think I can jump from here to there? Raise your hand. Oh, ye of little faith. There's one. I have one believer right over here. I have one friend. Two. Thank you. Okay. Don't, I don't want to set you up too, your hopes too high here, okay? I'm going to try. See if I can do it. I think you have to swing your arms. That helps. <laughs> Four feet, maybe? Can I get a, come on, just a courtesy applause here, okay? Okay, that's four feet. That's probably about the best I'm going to do. I'm sorry. Now, there's some of you 
younger folks, a little more athletic, Pastor Phil, <laughs> and you could come up here and you could jump farther than me, no doubt. But will you be able to jump from here to there, yes or no? No. I'm sorry, no. The answer is no. And so you may be a good person. You may do a lot of good things. You may be pretty good, and you may be a lot better than these people that are in jail or deserve to be in jail or, uh, you know, abuse children or whatever. They're back here somewhere, and you're up here somewhere. Great! But you still fall short of what God requires. And on your own, you're not going to make it. That is exactly why Jesus had to come. And that's why he died. He died on the cross. And my friends, when he was hanging on that cross, God the Father, God the judge of the universe, put on his own son the punishment for all of, all of that part that you, you're short. All of your sins. All of the wrong that you have done. The Lord Jesus Christ took your penalty. He paid your punishment Receiving it on the cross. He did that. That's why he had to suffer so terribly. Because he was taking upon himself the judgment for the sin of the world. And, but then he, he rose again. And he is triumphant over death and over sin and over the grave. He is triumphant. And now he is the Savior of the world. What you have to do is you have to accept him. And accept his payment on your behalf. You say, well, no, I'm, I'm really, Pastor Phil, I hear what you're saying, but I'm really not that bad of a person. I'm just going to see how it works out for me. I'm not going to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm just going to keep doing the best I can, and I think I can get pretty close. That's a recipe for disaster. I would say eternal disaster. The Bible says that the, the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. A wage is what you earn. A wage is what you've done, what you've worked for. You get paid a wage, and it would be unjust for them not to pay you the wage that you earned at work, right? You'd be mad if they didn't give you what you earned. Well, God says that we're all out here working at sinning in our thoughts, in our words, in our attitudes. We're all and we're earning something for all of this work we're doing at sinning. We are earning death, eternal death. And if God were fair, if he were a just judge, if he were to give you and I what we rightfully do deserve, it would be eternal death in a place called hell. But he doesn't want that. And so he gives us a gift it's a gift, and it's called eternal life. You don't, a gift is very different than a wage. A gift you didn't earn. A gift you don't necessarily deserve. A gift is something that someone else paid for. Someone else paid for the gift. They paid the price of the gift, and now they give it to you. It's valuable. It's a gift, but it has great value that someone else paid for, and now they can give it to you. And the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life isn't something that you earn because you never would. You never could. Eternal life is the gift of God, and it's a gift because Jesus Christ paid for it with his death and his blood on the cross. What you and I have to do is we have to believe that, and we have to accept that. We have to trust that. We have to say to God, you know what, God? I'm sorry. I was wrong. I am no longer going to trust in myself and my own merits, my own prideful goodness. You know, we kind of we can be we can feel kind of pride, prideful about how good of a person we are. <laughs> you have to put all of that aside and say, I'm lost. I have no hope on my own. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And Jesus, I accept you as my savior. That's what substitutionary atonement is. First Peter 3:18 said it this way. Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Then it goes on. He suffered physical death, but he was raised back to life. 
Now that's the gospel. That's what you need. That's what I need. He was a suffering servant. He suffered for the world. Now, you think about uh, the suffering of Christ, and, and I want to kind of broaden this idea because it wasn't just his suffering on the cross. It wasn't just that last week of his life. Actually, from the time he came into the world, he, him, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, in all of his glory and all of the splendor of heaven, when he stepped out of that place and he came down to be born as a little baby in Mary's womb, that was a huge step down. He was becoming a servant by even coming into this world. And um, he was born into poverty. He, was a very, not, he wasn't just born as a human. He was born as a very poor, abject, poor family into poverty. He was born during a time of bu- a brutal oppression from the Roman Empire. He lived under a local regional king who was a tyrant named Herod. So he never experienced any of the freedoms that you and I enjoy. He didn't have those. Because he lived under the empire of the Romans. All of the systems of his day were corrupt. The, the religious system, it was corrupt. The political system of his day, it was very corrupt. The healthcare system of his day was corrupt. The taxation system, it was only corruption and greed everywhere. And his, then you add that to the fact that his own siblings doubted him. His whole life, his whole world, his his closest friends did not understand him. And his enemies were constantly trying to kill him. That was his life. It was a life of humiliation and suffering. The very same kind of sufferings that you and I go through. Right? The world's not that different at the end of the day, is it? And the experiences we have, we, we experience these same kinds of things. Do you know why? Because they are human suffering. They are human suffering. You say, well, what do we do in the face of suffering? How do we win in the face of suffering? Jesus taught us how. You pick up your cross and you carry it. You, you do the best that you can. You don't give up. You, you try to alleviate your own suffering, and then you try to be a good neighbor and alleviate the suffering of those nearest to you. That's what you do. You, the, he told us that we are to strive to overcome, that we are to try to o- overcome evil with good. That's what you do. He said it's more blessed to give than to receive. He said, let your light shine. Love your neighbor. Be salt. Do good. Love your family. Lift up those around you. Make the best of your suffering. That's exactly what he did. And that's what we should do. In the words of that very famous theologian, Dory the fish. I'm going to let that sink in here, okay? To quote the famous theologian, Dory, just keep swimming. That's what you do in the face of human suffering. You just keep swimming. And that's, you know, when multiple times a day when I call Joan or my wife texts Joan or we communicate with their family, what are, you, what are we doing? We're just trying to keep swimming. As her husband of 52 years is in the very process of dying, what do you do in the face of that? You just keep swimming. Now the, I, want to, I want us to move on quickly. I want you to look at verse 6. I want you to look at verse 6 because this is the, um, this is the second place you're going to mark in your Bible. Are you ready? I know some of you have been, you've been like, you know, been wanting them write in your Bible all of this time. Take out your pen, and even if you have the Black Pew Bible, look at verse 6, and you can mark this. I'm giving you permission. I'll never do this again. His followers said to him, they asked him, saying, Lord, 
Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Underline the word kingdom, the kingdom. And put a number two by it. And if you want to write the word, you can write king. He's a king. He's a king. In in verse 3, he's a suffering servant. In verse 6, they're acknowledging that he is a king. And they said, Lord, are you going to establish yourself as king now? Finally? We've been waiting for this for years. Because the Jewish people, their concept of a Messiah wasn't really like Isaiah 53. They really weren't, they, they kind of skipped that passage on some level. Somehow, they kind of missed that. They looked at all of these other Old Testament passage, passages that talked about the Messiah, that he would be a king, and he would deliver Israel, and he would establish peace and justice and prosperity for all of Israel. And, and, and all of these, years, those were prophesied before, and they had all been waiting for this Messiah. As a matter of fact, the birth of every male child to a Jewish family. It was treasured and it was hoped that perhaps this one is the Messiah. And they longed for the day because they had been pillaged. They had been overrun. They had been uh, exploited. And here they were, hundreds of years later, still oppressed by the Romans, an an evil dictatorship over their lives, a brutal dictatorship. And so they, well, they were looking for the Messiah that would be king, that would deliver them from the political oppression which they suffered, and that he would establish this beautiful reign that was so talked about. And even his followers, they did not understand. Whenever he talked about that he was going to die on a cross, they, it just went right over their heads. Because they were saying, Jesus, when are you going to establish your kingdom? Right? And, and, and then, then, they, then they saw him die on the cross. And they thought, but he was supposed to be a king. What happened? And they were so discouraged and they were hiding. And, they were, and then Sunday morning, it was just like it all started over again. All of the hope. He's alive. He's risen. And here he is uh, 40 days later. And they're seeing him and they're excited and they're saying, now are you going to do it? Now are you going to establish your kingdom? That's what they wanted to do. That's what they wanted to see. And isn't that what we all want in our hearts? Don't we want to see justice and hope? Don't we look forward to something more? And, and, uh, but they overemphasize the triumphant king part so much so that the suffering servant part was, was really missed. Did you know that during the, in the Jewish people to this day, to this day, our dear Jewish friends stumble over the fact that Jesus Christ would be the Messiah because he died on a cross. But did you know that um, some of the rabbis saw this in those they only use the Old Testament, right? Some of the rabbis saw this in Isaiah and in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, during the Middle, uh, the Middle Ages, many rabbis taught that there would be two messiahs. That's how they, they, that's how they sorted this out in their mind. They, they looked at all of the Old Testament and all of the promises and the prophecies and said, oh, there must be two messiahs. One is going to come and he's going to suffer and die for his people. But then there's going to, there has to be another Messiah that's going to come, the one who's going to be king, and he is going to rule and reign and establish this earthly kingdom that is peace and prosperity. There must be two Messiahs because when we look in the Old Testament, we see the Bible in Zechariah and in Isaiah and in the Psalms. It talks about a Messiah that would, that would suffer and die for his people. But then in the few, a few pages later, it talks about a Messiah that's going to triumph and rule and reign. And so there must be two Messiahs. That's how they sorted this out. And um, let's move quickly, because I want you to see the third place that we're going to mark in our Bible is in verse 11. And so Jesus was standing there in front of them. Well, let's begin reading in verse 7. 
He said to them when they, when they asked him about if he was going to rule and reign. Is it, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now what is that? That is the ascension of Christ. This was 40 days after he rose from the dead, and he is ascending back into heaven, glorified. He is ascending. He is leaving them. But wait, they, they thought he, now he's going to become king, right? Now, now he's leaving. In verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These were two angels. And so they were helping them out, helping them to understand. In verse 11, notice what it says. Who also said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This is the clincher. This is where you're going to underline. This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Are there two messiahs? No. They were mistaken. There's one Messiah that will come twice. The angel tells them, this same Jesus that is leaving you, he is going to come again in like manner. The same way that you saw him leave, that's how he's going to come again. So this is the solution. This is the resolution to what we're seeing here. The triumph of the great servant king. The dilemma that there is a Messiah that suffers and reigns. When Jesus Christ came the first time in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he came in humility. He came suffering. He came dying on a cross. When he comes the second time, he is going to come triumphant. He is going to come uh, Riding on a white stallion, he's going to come conquering. He's going to come as king who establishes an earthly rule of peace and prosperity. It was, I, I, you know, I was thinking about this, and it's kind of like this, this mystery that we're talking about today. It's kind of like a well-placed Easter egg. You know, you ever been to the Easter egg hunts? And, we, and we, this happened to us a couple of times. You go to Easter egg hunt... And not all of the eggs get found, right? I mean, you, some of you dads, you're just like ornery, you know, the way you hide these eggs, right? You, you've got this two-foot, two year, three-year-old, and you've got eggs on top of the picket fence way up here, and you're just giggling to yourself, right? And your wife is getting irritated because you're ornery. Well, that happens, right? And so there's eggs that are so well hidden, they don't get found. And literally, this is no joke, we have been out, you know, where we used to do our Easter egg hunts, not our own property, someone else's property. We've been out there at a cookout in June and find an Easter egg, right? And, and, and this is the kicker, okay? These people were very generous. And when you open the egg, what you find in that egg that kind of got forgotten and kind of like hidden so too well, you don't find a moldy piece of candy that's six months old. You know what you find? You find a $20 bill that was neatly folded and stuffed in there, and there it still is. And six months later, it's still just as valuable as it was back at Easter time, right? And my friend, when you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again, you say, well, I never really understood that, Pastor Phil. What is that like? Well, I'm going to tell you in about 30 seconds what it's like. But I just want you to know this. It is extremely valuable. It is extremely valuable. And if you never knew it before, and you're just finding this egg today, the Lord Jesus Christ, the same one who died on that cross for your sins, that same Jesus is coming back again. And he's not coming in a manger to a poor family to be spit upon and mocked and ridiculed. No, my friend, he is coming on a, riding on a white stallion with all of the armies of heaven. And the Bible says that he will put down every tyrant, every evil uh, 
a doer. He will put down all sin and wickedness, and then he will purge this entire universe of all evil and sin. And here on this earth, he will establish a kingdom, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people, a kingdom that will be peace and prosperity and health and blessing. That is what it will be. He is a triumphant king. And he will come one day as that king. Will you be ready? Will you receive him as that? My friend, the only way that you can receive him as your triumphant king and not, I mean, you know, the, the Matthew 24, 35 says that when Jesus comes back like I just described, it says the ma- nations will mourn. They'll mourn? Why would they mourn at something so spectacular and so wonderful? They will mourn because he's coming in judgment. He's coming to put down all of their evil deeds. So my friend, the only way that the second coming of Christ is good news for you is if you have accepted the first coming of Christ as good news and that you are ready. Your sins are forgiven because you have accepted the Savior. You accept Him as Savior, and then He is your King. And you can look forward to that. Have you accepted Him as your Savior and as your King? Let's bow together for prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, in the quietness of this moment, I want to share a brief prayer, but before I do, and we're going we're gonna to sing, I think, one last song also, but before we pray and sing, I, I just want to give you, someone here today, the opportunity. Perhaps God's Word has touched your heart today, and you know that right now the need of your heart is to receive Christ as your Savior and your King. Now, now He's already the Savior of the world. He's already a triumphant King. And that's just a fact. The question becomes, is he your Savior? Is he your King? In the quietness of this moment, you can open up your heart in faith and say, dear Jesus, I accept you. I accept your gift of eternal life. Not, I, I st- I'm going to stop trying to earn it. I don't, I don't want to believe that anymore. I, I accept Jesus. I accept you as my Savior. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your gift. Would you please be king of my life? My friend, you can say that prayer right now. And we invite you to do that. And if you are making that decision in your heart today, would you please let me know that? Would you please make us aware? Because we would love to rejoice with you. We would love to pray with you and help in any way that we can. It's the most important decision you could ever make in your life. We invite you to do that in this very moment. Our Father God, we thank you for this opportunity we've had today just to consider your Son, Jesus Christ, all that he is and all that he means. We pray, dear God, that each heart would be moved and drawn closer to you, that in the midst of our suffering, we would realize that you suffered right alongside of us, that you suffered for us, that you are the Savior and you are the coming King. 